So I've brought Brian Wang back on today because I am going to be playing in territory that is above my pay grade. I mean, if you look up above my pay grade in the dictionary, you'll find my picture <laughs> related to the subject matter that we're going to be covering today. But I know that Brian Wang, at least, is uh, somebody who is very uh, clearly educated and uh, has experience in this area. So, Brian, uh, glad to have you on board today. Glad to be here, Randy. All right. So if you like having Brian on, you know what to do. I don't have to tell you anymore. You know, I'm sure you'll see some notifications uh, in terms of, uh, you know, joining Patreon, following Brian over on his Patreon. He's easy to find everything. Everything is under my, uh, next big, big, big future. future. <laughs> next big next, future. Next, next big future. So look for Brian on Twitter, on his, on his uh, website in particular. That's really what he's... Uh, got going right now this is his big website huge website okay so brian all right let me let me uh let me go ahead and quote elon here whoops i just got the wrong information up just going to take me a second to find the right information here here we go um my prediction is that we will go from an extreme silicone shortage today to an to an electricity shortage in two years he said that mm -hmm. during an event uh earlier this month mm -hmm. um XAI, so in other words, his 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 the entire AI system, but even his own company, is going to be advancing advanced intelligent, and that is going to take up a tremendous amount of uh, of compute. Um, and so basically, we got we got EVs. So so the the folks that are worried and af afraid somehow the 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 folks that are doing a lot of fud about the BEV business going forward have indicated a great concern that there's not enough grid to handle the BEVs in the future, two, three, four years out. And I can see about three or four years out, I can see my own issues where it might start to cross, get a little, little bit tough out there if they hit the numbers that we think that they're going to hit. But now Elon says, okay, because of chat GPT or GPT in general, now we're adding something even bigger, which is video compute, where we're having where we're using video to uh, train these neural nets. Uh, that this is going to take even more massive amounts of uh, of compute, and that that's going to use up a bunch of energy. So, tell me what yours. And he says, "Oh, and it's going to get way worse. Uh, Ten years from now, fifteen years from now, we're going to be we're going to be looking at something like being a two. We're going to be." Producing one third, and we'll need three times as much mm -hmm. of what of energy mm -hmm. for the electricity that we'll be using. So okay. three times as much as what's on the plan right now. Even the best case plan, he said, take the best case plan and triple it is what he said. Okay, okay. So um, I've looked at the various issues of um, <laughs> scaling. Um, you know, for the master plan part three, you know, getting to 30 terawatt hours, all those kind of things. And um, uh, basically when you start getting to a lot of mega packs and a lot of um, semi trucks, right? 30 million semi trucks and all that kind of thing. And basically all electric cars, not just the new cars, but the fleet, right? That end state, um, you're um, looking to take 20%, 25% of all oil production and then you're going to make it with electricity, right? Because I'm no longer running diesel trucks. I'm running electric semi trucks, right? That's one of the big things because I'm, um, you know, the semi trucks are getting like um, a gallon every seven to ten miles, and they're driving, you know, thirty billion miles in the United States, you know, how many tens of billions of miles in China and the place like that. And actually, they drive more uh, in China because that's the industrial thing. Asia has more stuff than, than Europe and and uh, United States. So, you know, basically I must change, you know, 25 million barrels per day into electricity. And that basically works out to about 20 to 30%, you know, then more if you're growing. If we say, okay, we need to have more vehicles, more stuff than our current base because they grow the economy, you know. Let me, 20, let, go ahead. let me make sure, let me make sure I'm catching, I'm, 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 uh, uh, you know, getting this straight because I, I might have to tell my wife later. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I need to be sure that I know where we're going here. All right. So the oil that we're using today, when it, the fleet is pretty much fully replaced, the electric fleet, 
mm-hmm. is pretty much 100% replacing the ice fleet, which is 15, 20 years from now, we should be- 20, 30 is, you know, early, late, you know, years. things things that are wrapping up really, really well at that point. So your calculations are that at that point, we'll need 25% less oil because that is, a, if, if we're equivalent, if there's no additional miles traveled or additional usages compared to what we see now. And of course, that doesn't count that we might become more efficient in electric usage, but just kind of a, a same for same. Yeah take away 25% of the the total oil business and replace yeah. it with electricity. Okay. Right, right. Because if you just, you know, okay, if we have, here are the 100 million barrels, 110 million barrels per day that we're using, and they say, okay, how much is for transportation? Well, uh, ground transportation, then that's about 20, 25%. Okay. Right? And then you have like 5% for air and shipping and rail and blah, blah, blah. And then you got uh, industrial usage and then you got residential usage. Right. Okay. So when you just look at those, the big overall picture, and then, you know, it's, those factors are roughly equivalent around the world. Then if I electrify all ground transportation, then I've taken all that stuff I'm f- using with oil and it's going to electricity. Right. So however I generate that electricity, you know, nuclear power, solar, batteries, et cetera. But okay. I have to get the power because I'm, I'm still driving the miles, but instead of a, a gallon of oil, I'm using kilowatt hours. Right. So. All right. So now, so we have the EV transition and Elon is saying that we were maybe a few years out before the EV thing was going to start impacting the electric grid in a way that could create its own shortages. I mean, we hear shortages from time to time in tough weather or whatever, but just in general, we would start to have this crossover of a problem because of EVs. Um, many that are the fudsters out there have been complaining loudly that this was going to be a bigger problem than than the folks that are the, the green community are making it out to be. But Elon is saying, yeah, it's going to be a problem. But now we're going to add this whole new problem on top of it because the compute that we're going to need for the for uh, all this uh, uh, GPT and for now using the same GPT methods to do video. This is going to use a ton of compute, and what what do you what do you think this is looking like at this point? So so currently, um, the various statistics around how much we use um, for global IT cloud computing um, estimates seem to be about two hundred forty to three hundred twenty terawatt hours uh, in a year. So the U.S. is about like forty one hundred terawatt hours. Um, Europe about thirty two hundred terawatt hours. Globally. 19,000, 20,000 for electricity. So, and it's growing, you know, world economy grows, then our electric usage or energy usage goes up. Um, so um, computing power is still around that one, one and a half percent level, right? And that's worldwide, worldwide. Worldwide, worldwide, yeah. But if you, it's not evenly distributed, right? Because it's right. mostly in you know, US, Europe, China, you know, wherever the big sure. data centers are, right? So, you know, but then that's also where the electricity is. Anyway, so then it could be around 3%, you know, of the U.S. Uh, electricity usage, right? But that stuff is growing at a rate of like, you know, 30, 40%, right? Because a year, a year, a year. A year. So a tripling, uh, sorry, a doubling every three years, you know, in really good years, if things were to grow 50%, 50%, then you have a doubling, right? So that is, um, you know, it gets really, really significant. It's like suddenly I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sucking up the power, like at 320 um, terawatt hours per year, a one gigawatt hour nuclear plant efficiently run in the United States would generate about eight terawatt hours, right? So I'm looking at 40 nuclear plants for all that power. But, you know, you're sucking at different points, but they tend to build the big data centers, you know, like, you know, uh, Google ha- and Amazon, you know, have like 10 or 20. They build them beside um a nuclear power plant or a um, hydro dam or a big solar farm places with the excess electricity right where they can suck it off cheap because they're thinking i want the cheapest thing right so because you know all this pricing and other stuff and availability is is different so they were kind of like leeching off the ex- excess for a long time and they but now they're so big that they have to you know either make new power or you know they can't, you know, displace and say, okay, you know, I'm not going to power that, uh, you know, the Pentagon or something like that, that big building. I'm going to suck up all this power. And then the Pentagon will go, whoa, 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 I need power too, right? You know, so 
that that's the problem is that you start you know there's still excess power in different places like you know texas has about five terawatt hour. as you build extra solar because it's generating at the wrong time you can get the power that's why the batteries come in where i can shift it to the right time but basically as i become bigger and bigger all this um little sneaky sucking power here and there you know getting cheap power that there i become like i am so big you know going to 10 percent 20 percent that's like you got to build so, it special so, compute, so you're saying compute could go from three percent in the united states to 10 or 20 percent by the mid 30s for instance yeah at the same time that we're asking the electric power capacity to increase dramatically because of of uh, bevs and then on top of that we are saying we also want electric stove ovens uh, yeah. stoves we want elect we want uh, uh heat pumps to uh, take over for the oil that we're using in our oil or gas natural gas that we're using in our homes i mean so there's yeah. this massive amount of demand that's being created and elon is saying that uh, 10 or 15 years from now we, we're going to need triple but it's going to hit us earlier because of gpt and other kinds of of uh, compute needs we're looking at two to three years from now. We're going to be we're going to be in a world of hurt if we don't start putting out some tremendous either savings. We either need to become more efficient at the use of energy. Now, can we start there? So, so it's either save or make more or both. Right. So, Elon. So, one of the things I was confused a little bit about. I know a little bit about it. My dad was an electrical engineer. You'd think I'd know more about this stuff. <laughs> mm. But there, in fact, he was in the he was in the uh, what do you call it? transformer business thing? Electric yeah. transformer business. Anyway, if you um, if you want to save energy in these massive data centers, Elon mentioned something about methods that could be used that would save a lot. I did a quick um, little bit of research, and one of the things was using water instead of air to cool. Mm -hmm. But Elon wasn't talking about that. That was the one that came up as in in the research I did. He was talking about some capacitors or some anyway some electronic ways of of managing these systems that would be a lot better so so basically um the transistor the information itself if i do any kind of computation right that's going to use a certain amount of power so by you know my my gigaflops whatever like that you know you can say okay it's going to use you know point whatever watts right watt hours um it's just no matter how you slice it, physics says you will use that power, right? But you know we're well more wasteful than that. You know we're not at the efficiency level of, of physics. But fundamentally, when I do the com computation, there, there's going to be power used. So you know there's you can be less wasteful and you can say okay instead of being you know. 10 times the wasteful, I'm down to, you know, two or five, but that would mean I have to systematically change many, many things, right? To shift from this to this, you know, it'd be, you know, a hundred million servers, right? I got, I got, you know, I got phased out, it's, it's, it's transition. I can start getting, you know, 10%, 20%, but going from, you know, getting from 10, 20%, 30% more efficient to, you know, three times more efficient, you know, is a, is a huge ask. Right. And it's also about how I do the computing and all that kind of stuff. So it's, and the more I'm less wasteful, then the harder it is to program it and to do it. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, um, drive from, from here to New York, but do it, you know, don't use that much gas. So I'm hypermiling, I'm driving 55 miles per hour, I'm you know, streamlining and doing all that stuff. So you can do it. But then it's like, and, all 10,000 people are going to do the same thing. But then other people saying, I still got this car. It works. I'm going to go at 20, you know, 15 miles per gallon. F you, right? So so then, so there's the issue of like changing the whole fleet. You know, changing the whole fleet of computers and like that right. is a very difficult thing, right? It's just not going to happen, right? So if it becomes an emergency or it becomes so painful, like, you know, we go from, you know, 10 cents a kilowatt hour up to 30, because, you know, the, the price will respond. If the demand goes that out of whack, then the, the price will go from 10 cents a kilowatt hour to 30 cents to 50 cents, whatever, right? Oh. In Europe, it's at 30 cents right now, right? So it goes up to a buck per kilowatt hour. Then it's kind of like, 
oh, you can keep running your inefficient thing, but you know, it's going to cost you a dollar per kilowatt hour. Are you still going to use it? You know, it's going to cost you like $10,000 a month. Yeah. Right. So, so then it's like, okay, I, now I got to junk this thing, inefficient thing. And I got to switch to the, to the efficient thing. Right. But, you know, going through that painful price spiking thing, it, I'm sure something that, that Elon wants to avoid. Boy, right? yes. <laughs> so, so then he's saying, you know, let's not be stupid here. We can see this is going to happen. Right. So, Maybe let's get ahead of the problem as opposed to, but you know, like as we see, like if the automaker is always behind the problem, yeah. right? Or, or you know, other, or, you know, countries and nations are behind the problem, right? So that's the, the issue is that um, the choices have to be made, the uh, systemic uh, shifts in order to get to more efficiency as opposed to, and then there's another side of the forcing factor where if I do this more compute, I'm doing it so I can make money. I'm yeah. doing it so I can, you know, get this AI solution and, and become the Google and whatever. So Google's saying, okay, I'm making $200 billion a year and, you know, $10 billion for energy. I'm going to pay it because I make $200 billion a year. Yeah. Right? So, but then who gets squeezed out is the people who are making lower margin. Right. right? Sure. Um, so, but, you know, there are huge things like the new superconducting uh, possible technology, which would take time to develop, but which could suddenly drop energy use by a thousand times. And there's also something called um, reversible computing, where if I can physically reverse the computation, right, then that can save me um, 10 billion times, right? Oh. But that whole thing is like, on the, uh, you know, beyond the bleeding edge of whatever, it can be done, if there, you know, the physics say we need to get there eventually, but um, it changes things a lot to, to get there. Ultimately, something that will happen. So the ones, so the ones that I don't need to uh, go back to college to learn about, the ones that seem pretty obvious to me are either you put in a lot more solar, because that's mm -hmm. the fast one, and yeah. a lot more batteries, so anytime that you're so, you know, government could say to the IBM, the IBMs and the Microsofts and the Googles and 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 to the Teslas, OK, if you're going to put in more compute, then you've got to put in enough solar to or some kind of power. You've got to be responsible specifically for mm -hmm. generating that additional so, uh, energy that you're going to be using because we're not going to let you take it off the grid or individuals right. our individual states can say that. Right. Uh, individual utility companies who say, nope, we ain't got no more, you know? <laughs> right. So that would become, you know, one of the ones that I can, I can see that as a possibility. The second mm -hmm. would be, as I mentioned, the idea that maybe cooling would happen through uh, some kind of. Uh, 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 so cooling is about 40 to 50 percent, uh, 40 percent of the, of the, um, the cost okay. because they run them too hot and something like that. Yeah. So um, yeah, so there's, different kinds of technologies there, you know, some is more efficient than others. Um, and, you know, obviously air, you know, straight air cooling without running a fan is, is the, the cheapest. Um, but then, you know, we've in general gone way beyond that a long time ago. Um, um, so, yeah. So, so basically people usually don't want to make that sacrifice to like, run so inferior because I, I need to have my ectoflop machine running super hot but it, again ectoflops are not all the same because ai ectoflops are 16-bit versus the old double um word link 64 bit for other super applications so um it's easier to get more ectoflops you know 10 times more or whatever from the ai version of because they're using shorter um shorter words Okay, so so there are methods, uh, and again, a quick bit of research. There are methods like how you stack the uh, computers, whether you face them close, cl face to face, or something. I didn't fully understand why all that would matter. You've got water instead of air um, as your cooling method, but mm -hmm. you, but talk to us a little bit about. But I think if, if if your application, you know, was stressing things that much, in general, you'd have gone to the most efficient thing there anyway. Oh, right. Okay. You know, because, you know, like if I'm running my Cray Exaflop supercomputer or something like that, you know, I, the, the fact that I need to have a, you know, 30, 50, 100 mega, megawatt power thing, right? One tenth of a nuclear power plant, right? right. 
<laughs> I'm I'm paying that every year. So the fact I pay a billion dollars for the machine, and then I'm paying, you know, fifty million dollars, hundred million dollars on, on running costs. You know, the electricity, the the air conditioning, and and the the water cooling, all that stuff. So if I can shave off my operating cost by half, I'm highly motivated to spend fifty million, hundred million dollars right. to to do that. Right. right? So uh, and then if I'm running a big data center, Google data again, the uh, they're already economically driven to be very efficient. They're not like throwing that stuff away because, you know, $10 million a year or something like that, if I, if I you know, or $50 million a year, if I can shave $10 million off, the team is motivated to do that. Sure. Right. So, so what about these other ones though, apparently? So I don't understand at all about the superconductivity. Is that within the computers themselves? Is this something that would allow the electrons within the, actual uh cpu or no not cpu i see what i i see what i don't yeah, know <laughs> yeah so so um supercomputers ha uh superconducting has been around for a while um we, we've had you know the nobium metal and the other metal ones that have to be cooled down to you know like liquid uh hydrogen helium whatever type temperature you know four to five degrees uh above zero and then there's a less uh, stringent ones that you know can be cooled by liquid nitrogen which makes it you know 100 times cheaper to do that but you know like still this is like way beyond the cost of um of uh water cooling regular water cooling right sure. liquid nitrogen is different sure. um so that's what we've been for a while the latest news which has been out for the last week or so is that um south koreans say they've come up with um room temperature superconductors so right. this is this is the buzzword. Room this is the buzzword. But you're super conducting. Okay. Right, right. And I've been all over this, following okay. this closely. Right. Okay. So um there have been other people who said I've done I got room temperature superconducting, right? The the hitch with those other ones was they needed diamond anvils, not just regular diamond anvil, billion time pressure. And look, I I it's room temperature, but it's a billion times the pressure. You've substituted one problem for this other problem. insane problem, right? And so it's just, it's just not practical, right? Whether it worked or not. And then there was the issue of whether it worked or not. There was some controversies about what's some fake data and something like that. And they had something under pressure and oh, the room temperature. Oh, I lost it. I had this tiny speck of something and then it, it floated away. You know, the, the anvils let it go or something like that. Anyway, so so that was the the, the big thing was that could you get it practical away from but you know they had used the other slightly less practical things because they're still useful uh -huh. because they can save so much energy and power, so that the the, the New York Navy spent a bunch of you know money to make a thirty six um, megawatt um, um, reactor for running their um, uh, and turbines and stuff for running their like aircraft carriers and shit. Um, so uh, so they um, were able to make that one third smaller. Uh -huh. so so you can. By going to superconductor, even if you had add, add the extra cooling in, you can shrink stuff down. Anything electrical, a lot of power systems and stuff from, you know, computing to, you know, uh, electric engines to other stuff like that. But you need to have the right thing. You need to have superconductors not just, you know, solve whatever temperature it is and then be able to cool it to that temperature, but have the current and the, and the magnetic fields work so you can get it to the thing. So... All these things are different for computing and for quantum computing. They're generally using nobium uh, superconductors, so not the the ones discovered a few decades ago, the ones discovered before that. And they use Josephson junctions. So instead of a transistor, it's a Josephson junction, and that thing is like a thousand times more energy efficient. And they use and they mill, make them by the millions on chip for these things for quantum computers and for the application where I need this thing blazingly fast, right? Blazingly fast, like our laptops, what, four gig gigahertz, right? Been stuck there for like 20 some years, right? 20, 30 years, we've been stuck at four gigahertz. You might be able to get to 4.5, you're, you're, you're stuck there four gigahertz. These superconducting chips, they can go to like 800 gigahertz. They can go to like terahertz and stuff like that. So I don't have to do, before I had to go like a bunch of stuff in parallel, you know, 40 different cores, 64 different cores. I'm running things in parallel because I can't get faster than four gigahertz. Now I can have one core that runs at 800 gigahertz and does the, the power of 20 
straight up and maybe even more because I don't have the efficiency, inefficiency of like chunking up my problem and spreading out among 20 different things. I can just like one thing blatantly fast, 800 gigahertz. So a yeah. hundred times more powerful, a thousand times uh, lower power. They're using this for the no beam chips. They gave University of Rochester, USC, $15 million to, to work out this for, for their defense military computing thing. So from this old way they could do it. But now if we get room temperature superconductors, better superconductors, which will take a few years to sort of, even though um, th they seem to be able to do it with like regular lab equipment, you wow. know, stuff like at, a, at, a, at an undergraduate lab, which is why the replication happened within a week where they got this like little slivers, uh, paint chip size things floating above magnets, which was a, a classic thing of like, is it a superconductor? Is it floating above this other magnet? Although there's diamagnetic and paramagnetic, which can kind of float, they don't float as well as superconductors, which are perfect diamagnets. Anyway, if this thing happens, and it seems like the thin film version of stuff works even better than other stuff, then computing will change. And the other reason that I'm highly confident that if the thing's proven for real, and there's various theoretical confirmations from uh, Berkeley Labs, National Labs, China Labs, something like that, the theory stuff is starting to pan out. Although people still think don't count your, you know, chickens before they're hatched kind of thing. The reason I'm highly confident about this thing is that they're putting copper ions or they could gold or silver ions in the exact spot, which is like, this is called doping. I put a few atoms into something where I want it to be in order to perform, make it work better. Semiconductor industry, hundreds of billions of dollars, they're doping and putting molecules exactly where they want all the live long day, right? So this thing is like, oh, if you say all I have to do is dope this thing with copper and then I can get, get 100 times faster, 1,000 times cheaper, we're good. Let's, let's do it. Run that into the the, uh, the TSMC uh, fab. Let's uh, get the lines running and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, not super fast. You know, it still takes time to get this stuff to happen. But, you know, two years, three years, we could be getting these super chips. And the volume, like the, the difficulty of doing it in small volume smaller batches of course it's easier and then to scale up right but the driving force for the trillion dollar semiconductor industry to say master superconductors do it at scale make everything 100 times faster make everything a thousand times less energy right and with the thousand times less energy thing means i can do 100 times more compute and i'm still 10 percent of the energy because i'm a thousand times more efficient on yeah. energy right yeah. and then we know we're spending like um 3% of our, you know, national grid, maybe like 10, 20% of our national grid on this stuff. So the motivation is I don't have to build a hundred nuclear reactors in the United States and I get all this stuff. Yay. <laughs> right. Because that, that would take a nuclear reactor $20 billion, you know, 10 years to make or something like that each just for one. And I got to make a hundred of them. Right. That's like a trillion dollars. Right. So the motivation to convert this thing and get super efficient, it would be very strong. And it's like, right up their alley, make something molecularly precise and dump some uh, ions right where you need them to be. And then the other thing would be then if it's difficult to get to, to bulk scale for the, you know, really big magnet for those big, um, um, for the big, uh, uh, you know, aircraft carriers and stuff like that for the Navy. And then you have like a hundred ton magnet or something like that. Right. And you need to have something you know big. Uh, you know, different sizes, you know, but something huge. And for like all the Tesla vehicles, okay, it'd be great if I could have a, a superconducting magnet instead of a regular magnet there. I could get more power and all this kind of stuff. But I need to uh, make, you know, maybe a kilogram for every vehicle, right? So yeah. I got a million vehicles, I got to make a thousand tons, yeah. right? So, and then the value is, okay, I get a little bit more efficiency versus I am a hundred times faster on the semiconductor. So the compute applications come first just because I need less, and I get more out of it. And then it'll trickle down these other things. But you know, there'll be this trillion dollar industry driving the mastering of it. And then they'll make layers. Okay. If I can do one layer, I can do like a hundred layers. And I can make more and more a bigger and bigger thing. Right. So then it'll go to things like space applications, satellite applications, something where if I can make this 10 times better, instead of going to Mars in six months, I go to Mars in a month. I see. So, so who wants that? Who wants to pay a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars for a special, you know, engine that can take me, you know, to Mars 
you know, using a magnetohydrodynamic drive or something like that, which has been around for 60 years, but just didn't have the power. And then now I had spent a billion dollars to make this freaking engine so I can go to Mars in a month. Oh, Elon, you want that? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Duh. <laughs> okay, here, billion dollars. Oh, you do have billion dollars. Fantastic. So then we can make a bunch of those kind of special face. But you do that before you do, you know, certain other bulk applications where like, I need a freaking 10 million tons of this stuff. I need 100 million tons of this stuff, right? So that comes later. So it's, it's a, how fast can I make a bunch of this stuff? How much benefit do I get? I get the most from the compute stuff. Next will be certain space applications, certain aerospace applications, stuff where I need, I'm willing to pay a lot for this, you know, a little bit of the of the unobtainium, like the, the avatar, oh, right, right. Room, which is basically was room temperature super The yeah. unobtainium was that. So now we're going to get obtainium. We're going to get it. It's just like how much we get, when, how good is it? What are the, the parameters around it? So, and, and what you're saying is that you've dug deep on this and you think that what the South Koreans are showing looks like it's the real, because we get how many, you know, different things every single day of stuff that's done in the lab, but it can't be done uh, to scale. You're feeling like this looks like the real thing. So last night, Berkeley Labs, you know, the, you know, we have a four or five national labs, right? Berkeley Labs, they ran the six hour um, on the simulation on their supercomputers, and they say, yeah, this probably works, right? Wow. So they did it with, um, you know, um, the, you know, DFT, whatever calculations. So not definitive, not conclusive. You'd need to run it with phonon and blah, blah, blah calculations. But, you know, the first cut seems to, seem to work. And then Shenyang Labs in China, the Chinese National Lab in Shenyang, they also work from first principles and published papers saying, yeah, we think it's going to work too, based on first principles. And then we'll think it work even better with uh, silver and gold instead of copper, right? So the theoretical side is lining up. And then three or four um, videos showing them doing that floating magnet little, little piece of material. Two or three from China, one from an amusing person on, the, on Twitter, um, Iris Alexander, who has a um, uh, cat girl anime logo on her thing, and she's uh, sounds a bit nuts, but apparently a fantastic chemist. And the fact that you know her stuff work, you know, aligns with what other people are doing, seems to me that she didn't uh, fake it. Um, so, so, what, so what's the, so what's the business side of this? Other than the fact that it would be great for society, what's the business side? Is this is this a patentable process? Is this something that once we know that it can be done. There'll be 15 ways to do it. So it won't be patentable. Um, is this something? There'll be, there'll be thousands, tens of thousands of patents. There'll be um, Nobel Prizes at the yin yang. Um, it'll be, we will, it'll be like, we go from the age of uh, beginning electricity to the age of uh, superconducting electricity and superconducting power. It's like, it's a phase shift for, for our world. It's like all the stuff that, you know, so it's like, um, going from steam engines and blah, blah, blah. And then Edison comes along with electricity right. and stuff like that. And you had previously had, you know, whale oil things. And now we're going to the next level. It's like next level tech in many, many things. All right. So the, does that mean the South Korean company is got it and they're, it's theirs and they're going to be the ones that are going to get all the benefit? That's kind of what I'm asking. No. Or it's one of those things where somebody else is going to get, get around their patent easily because there's so many ways to attack the problem or... Yeah, there'll be um, classes of superconductors. This is, it was like, um, like I said, the Chinese race thing, we substitute uh, silver and gold, right? So that wasn't in the original um, uh, papers or the, well, although the South Korean patent did try to say, you know, many different kinds of materials. So they did get a patent that did that, right? They said many different kinds of materials. But <clears throat> for patent law, one patent like that, for something this important, you're not going to get support. And and also this kind of thing of like, China's going to say, blah, 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 patent. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you know, or I can make my economy 10 times bigger, yeah. right? Yeah. So how much is that patent going to hold up? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So so they'll have some, and yeah. they'll and they'll also the 18-year thing, you know, no extensions for you. And then any way we can wire down that patent, we will. And then we'll have all our own patents. And then it'll be like, 
you know, like you know, when IBM comes along and, you know, they have all these compute patents, it's like, I have my patent war chest, you have your patent war chest, and we you have to swap in order to get something done, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they'll be uh, swapping rights to patent. And they'll build building a patent pool. And then, you know, the theory guys have, have done the math, but it's like, fine, you got the start. But then, you know, just like the the CRISPR um, yeah. DNA thing, right? You know, three different groups, you know, did the work. And then, you know, they, you know, each of patents, you know, so it's, it'll be a complicated situation, but it won't be, in no way will it be a showstopper. So this is not legal advice. This is, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have a law degree, but I haven't passed the bar. So this is not legal advice. All right. So let's say for, as another direction on this, let's say that the room temperature supercomputing thing is 10 years off. That, it, you know, it turns out that it does take a while to ramp this thing up and to really get it to be significant. And it's not going to be ready for the two or three years from now when Elon is concerned that there just isn't enough power. What do you see? I know you are a huge solar guy. Mm -hmm. I know that Elon is talking about coming in with hydrogen in certain applications and coming in with uh, nuclear in some applications. I uh, uh, saw a story this morning, which I reported on this morning, where the first nuclear reactor was actually uh, 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 turned on yesterday, uh, first nuclear reactor in seven years, I think, in the United States. Um, we've got the micro computer, micro nukes, and and the uh, small, you know, smaller nukes that have been talked about. What are you seeing, Mister Futurist? <laughs> what will happen in addition to this that might help us get to where we need to get in a couple of years? Uh, so, so one, even if efficiency stuff happens. That just um, increases the eventual overall demand, right? When I, you know, like if I lower the price of um, gasoline and blah, 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 or, or cost of driving by five times, it, instead of keeping the same amount and being five times more efficient, I end up, you know, using 10 times as much, right? And, and you know, or, and be using up twice as much energy or something like that, or using, you know, 50 times as much. So, you end up using more, just like, you know, everything's more efficient now, but our economy is 10 times bigger than it was 100 years ago. So um, we're going to need to make more power no matter what, even if the, the efficiency stuff happens. Um, but, it, you know, it just changes how much we can do. Um, so we're going to have to make more power. We have to make a lot more solar. That 20 to 40 percent probably needs to go solar. Um, you know, Tony Siba talked about the... the um, superpower stuff where he says that we should, you know, make 200% uh, percent of the power that we need and then, you know, um, store it, save it, and, and, and then, you know, waste power, you know, spend it on compute where I'm not um, time limited, where I can, you know, use it when it's available. Um, so, and that could be the, the most cheapest way to do it by building a lot, a lot of solar. Um, and, and then you also build the, the other, uh, nuclear power as well. I think you should have more of the base load nuclear power, where basically it's one hundred percent of that uh, available all the time when it is available, and uh, not totally depend upon the solar because you know there could be things like um, <laughs> yeah. no, no, you know things like you know massive um, super cloudy days during the winter and stuff like that, where you could have like very low amounts of solar power for like two weeks over large regions, right? right? right. So it, it just um, doesn't work as well, like. You know, it only happens rarely, but then when it does happen, you've disrupted your economy and it costs you hundred billion dollars, right? So, so that you needs to be a rare event needs to be like once in several hundred years, once in a thousand years. Yeah. You know, the utility needs to be reliable. You know, so so our energy needs to be reliable. So we need to build a lot of it, and we can't. We're just scaling up how much you know China's you know got this you know uh, majority stake in the market share of how much uh, solar power gets made. Uh, the solar panels and that kind of stuff. And we just need to, you know, wrap that up. But, you know, just like um, Elon, make sure that we have um, certain battery production in other places outside of China. Right. You know, it'd be foolish to allow China to dominate just because they're willing to eat the losses on it. You know, just strategically, you know, you need to make more of it. So what about solar? I keep seeing uh, headlines about, uh, more double-sided uh, solar, more solar that works in the dark, 
more solar that's thin, uh, thin application, more solar that's gets way more energy per square inch or whatever. I mean, I keep seeing lots and lots of reports, but it always seems to me, I don't even sometimes look very deep into them because it seems like, okay, you've done this in the lab. Uh, is there is there anything like this uh, room temperatures, um, uh, superconductors that is close enough seemingly that might make a breakthrough in, in the efficiency of the, uh, of solar? So I think, that, you know, the, the, uh, type of solar that's uh, sorry. Let me cut that out. Um, so, um, uh, the new solar material, um, which is a perovskite. So it's a uh, way less expensive than silicon. Um, it's been worked on for you know maybe a couple of decades. And getting to to scale, so perovskite is something that's you know it just works out hugely economic in terms of like the, the, the abundance of it, and um, they've gotten the efficiency up. So it's kind of like the um, the equivalent of the uh, uh, iron phosphate battery. You know, you had nickel, which would be uh, the, mm -hmm. the silicon equivalent, and then now you got iron phosphate. So it's um, at scale, um, and it's got the efficiency. So that would be a swap over. So, so it's the kind of thing where, you know, just like there's a hundred different kinds of battery technologies, you know, solid state, you know, always, you know, hoping for solid state, hoping for solid state. Same thing on the solar side. There are these things which are like the equivalent of, of a solid state battery where it's like, oh yeah, it'd be great. But then things have been moving along and then, you know, they're not, you know, making the terawatt hours of stuff that we need, right? So... Um, same thing for, for, for solar in that, you know, all the new tech has to be cut with the, the filter of, can I actually make, you know, the whole industry work on this thing? Can I make a large chunk of the industry work on the thing? Otherwise, it's an interesting sideshow or a niche application. You know, even 2%, 5% of the whole industry it could be huge. Well, you know, the industry is, you know, 50%, you know, doubling every three to two to three years, four years, whatever. Um, it could be significant and and someone could make tens of billions of dollars off it. But in terms of like our overall planning of like where I'm saying I'm going to add 20% of the world electricity using blah, right? It can't be something that's, um, you know, too esoteric. You know, strategically, I could have my portfolio bets saying, okay, I'm going to have 2% of this thing. I'm going to try and support it. I'm going to, do stuff. Right. I'm going to try and get nuclear fusion going. But until it's ready to shoulder the load, which means it's got to 2%, 5%, you know, with my support, then I can't consider I'm going to get it to 20%, I'm going to get it to 50%, right? Because I'm still growing very fast. So it's just, I'm the, got this moving train and I got to have things that are ready to go and scale stuff up. And, and most of the stuff is not ready to go. Got it. And then we get into the situation like right now where there's more solar production than there are folks that are willing to take it and a little bit more uh, large battery production. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, in other words, CATL is overproducing. They have more capacity than what is being taken off right now. So you get into these swings where then somebody's like, well, I don't want to start my new factory because there's no demand right now. It occurred to me this well, morning. One, let, me, let me speak about that. Right? Is that that's why Tesla's strategy is so good, right? Is because, you know, there's the high demand for the electric cars, but then they're, you know, making the mega packs and they can flex that a bit, right? So then they can say to CTL, I will take all your batteries, which I said they will. And then, you know, I'll use them for a mega pack and some other things, right? And that, and then CTL can think, ah, oh, I can make this plan and I'll get, you know, Tesla who's taking almost half of my production and, you know, same thing for LG and other guys. So all the battery guys, suppliers say, Tesla, you're a wonderful customer. You're always taking my stuff and you're always, you know, flexing to, to make, you know, mega packs and stuff like that. And you're, you know, you're 10 times bigger than GM and Ford, you know, so then you're a great customer. And then we build factory just for you, yeah. right? Cause you're just fantastic. So that is, is a long-term play that if I'm thinking, oh, I got a cost cut and maybe you know financially the Ford and GMs 
can't do it. But having the model where they can take all the batteries, because we're going to go from here to 10x by 2030, 100x by 2040, then you need to ride through these things where it's like, you know, don't cut back. We're going to eat through. And, and the China thing in the solar is the government is supporting them on solar. Right. So when they run through these things, where, hey, we're losing money for this year, and next year. And then China government says, yeah, so what? Keep going. Yeah, just go ahead. So, you know, to a certain level, right? You know, yeah, okay, definitely. $100 billion. Okay, let's cut back a little. They go totally nuts. But, you know, they're, they're saying we're willing to, to eat these losses and to keep supporting you through this thing because at the end of the day, come out the other side, we're the Saudi Arabia solar. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, you know, just like Saudi Arabia, I, I'll eat through $20 oil when I can still make money on it, you know, $10 oil, because I will have the market and just like Russia would have that and OPEC. So we'll have 40% of the market, 50% of the market, right? So we're going to eat through these losses on, on the down years because strategically, we want to control the world of energy because ultimately you're ultimately going to need it, right? So we're going to look past some of this stuff. So same thing on the solar side, same thing on the, on the battery side. You have to have a plan. Right. So I've got, so now we've talked about the science and there we talked a little bit about the politics. Maybe one more level would be to think about the philosophy. So this occurred to me as I was putting this together this morning, and I even mentioned it a little bit on my show this morning. Do we need an Eisenhower moment where I hate big government, I hate top-down government thinking in general, and maybe mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be the government, maybe it needs to be Elon Musk. I mean, he's kind, he's put together his master plans, but his master plans say, here's what we need to make and here's what we need to make it, but they don't necessarily lay out the freeway system like Eisenhower did. No, not him, of course, but his team said, okay, here's where we need this highway and here we need this highway over here. And, you know, this will, this is how the, the, the thing should be laid out. It worked out really well. Um, do we need somebody somewhere in each country, I suppose, because it's going to be really different from from country to country to say okay here's the best way here's where we need to go local and how to get it local how to get it on rooftops whether that's residential whether that's commercial whether that's manufacturing whether that's uh over parking lots and in shopping centers here's here's how we need to put the solar out um, uh, it, it might be over canals, it might be over other waterways, it might be over farmland where it's mixed use. I mean, there's all these possibilities. So do we need, I hate to say the word because I'm such a conservative, do we need some central planning? <laughs> so so um, there already is a certain amount of um, that kind of um, large scale detailed plans. Um, NASA, Department of Energy have those kind of plans about how you scale them up they some of them may not be as uh bold as yeah. where we want to be because usually they're saying we'll need this by 2050 right right, right? and after the fact we need it by 2030 we need it by 2025 right? right so the plan they're there they're just uh, the timing of when they expect and project them to be is wrong right because the uh, energy information administration the international energy administration agency they're always wrong Right. You see, they, uh, they have those YouTube videos. Oh, here, look at their chart. Look at the projecting. They're wrong. So the planning is there. And the Eisenhower thing, like China does it, right? France did it, you know, with their national nuclear plants and stuff like that. So the countries are familiar with this thing. It's just the, the pace and the timing is not aligned to, they haven't fully um, accepted it's going to happen that fast. It's going to be this exponential. It's going to be this fast, right? Yeah. The the capability to plan is there. The capability to to, to do, you know, grid changes like that. They're just the plans are just, and, and the and the papers saying blah 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 happened by twenty fifty and by twenty sixty, right? Where it slowly grows to thirty percent in twenty thirty, you know, that kind of thing or twenty thirty five or yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's they have not accepted that it, the transition to all new electric vehicles could be over in four years. Yeah, yeah, right. They they don't. They don't have I that. Yeah, they don't believe that. They don't, they don't no, believe they, it. They haven't listened to Tony. 
Nimble Tony Siva is still Tony Siva is still right. considered to be just one little guy out there that's uh, never yeah. right or something. Yeah. I don't know, even though he's right over and over again. They can listen to me too. You know, I say the same thing that Tony has been saying. You say, say the same thing, but I say the same thing that Tony's saying. Just I haven't been as successful as Tony in getting out. You know, my videos and stuff like that. So, but I'm, I'm saying it too. You know, it's going to happen for you. Give the like Norway. You know, there's plenty of examples, data points. So it's not even just oh, I'm projecting out ten years right. and I'm doing some you know, cost calculation thing. It's like this other country is at 90%. They got there in four years. So it's kind of like maybe, and then this other country that 50%, 60%, you know, Switzerland or or whatever, right? China's already at 30%. You know, they could go to 50%, you know, next year, year after, go to the same percent two years after that. So there are these other examples that are there. And they say, oh, well, the U.S. needs, you know, a lot more pickup truck and, 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 uh, and large SUVs, well, Cybertruck. So, so the you know it's going to happen. Just that they have to, and so the planning there, they just have to make the changes. So, and they can look at, you know, master plan part three. They can look at that and, and actually believe it and look through it, as opposed to, you know, not. So then we also have a just one last one on my list. Maybe you've got something else on your list, but one last one on my list is this idea of beaming the power from space. Mm -hmm. uh, and have seen multiple, multiple headlines and read a couple of paragraphs that, uh, you know, this is supposedly getting close. What could go wrong? That just seems like <laughs> that seems like an atomic bomb. It's just ready to have a real problem on the other side. <laughs> OK, so this again, something that I'm very familiar with. I've uh, worked with, uh, you know, John um, Bucknell of um, uh, Vertisolis, which is a, a space based solar power company. Uh, I've written of my 30,000 articles, 8,000 have been on space. Um, so, you know, I'm deeply familiar with space and space-based solar power, why that is good. So basically, space-based solar power, I stick, I get the right orbit, I put in a solar power satellite, and it will you know, get power continuously, you know, either 24-7 or, you know, there's some better orbits where, where you get it half the time, but then I have two batches, one here, one here, and then combined, I get uh, seven by 24 coverage. So then it goes from 30% unreliable power, you know, 30% of the time, and it's unreliable, I don't know when I'm gonna get it, or only from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. when it's sunny, to all the time it's there. So then I'm beaming the power down from there, collecting it up there, then I can collect it up there, and then there's gonna be one, uh, a couple of data points. One is the 4,000, 4,400 uh, Starlink satellites, each you generate seven kilowatt hours of, of power, right? So 4,000 times seven, 28 megawatts from the Star, Starlink um, satellite network fleet. When you increase that by 10 times, you're at um, you know 280 megawatt hours, but then they're gonna be bigger, you know, because uh, the Gen 2 satellites be bigger, probably 10 times bigger and something like that. So you can get to your gigawatt, you know, your big nuclear power plant of power, up there just from Starlink satellites. So the solar will be collected there. It is not being beamed down, being used up there, yeah, yeah. right? Um, but if I make satellites specifically for the purpose of generating power and then sending it back, then it can be done with, um, if I use the microwave frequencies or radio frequencies, which we already use for communication like um, cell phones and stuff like that, they can just, that that's still energy coming down. And they, the um, uh, Caltech, you know, lit up an LED from beam power. So it has been done at, at this low power level. You just need to now scale it up. And when you get Starship going, you could take up 10 to 20 megawatts per launch. So then if you get the, the Starship launches down to 10 million bucks, then you could take, you know, take up 10, 20 megawatts, maybe more every time. And they can get lots and lots of this, uh, solar power up there, beam it. Initially, you're going to go to, you know, military bases where it's tough to, to get fuel trucks. You can get it to Hawaii, Alaska, you know, get to places where they don't, where the electricity is expensive, right? But then, you know, you get to where it get, gets competitive and and then that's when um, you beam it down. So, um, but and in terms of safety, yeah. yeah. Safety, yeah. So, so you're, okay, you're beaming microwaves. Mm hmm and so you can stand in front of them; they won't hurt you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're right now we're being beamed, microwave beaming through us from cell phones and other things like that. So it's all going through us. Is it 
perfectly healthy? Is it causing some amount of other stuff going on based on long-term studies? Maybe, but it's not like I'm being fried. It's, it, you know, it's wrecking me soon. If it's any effect, it's kind of like at the margins, right? Yep. And so should we uh, look at that long-term? Yes, we should. Should we beam it to, you know, outside of Arizona, outside of cities where, and we keep the area clear? Yeah, we should probably do that, oh, right? Wow. Um, you can also, you know, reflect it, you know, with the light, you know, just have mirrors up there, really light mirrors, and reflect it to existing um, solar farms. Like a massive multi-gigawatt solar farm, that'd be a big enough target for me to beam it down. I just need to not do it during nighttime where I'm like, making, <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, you could. China has done that for some cities and stuff like that. Oh. But, um, you know, you want to, but, you know, we want a consistent power from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Yeah. Then I could do stuff to, to do that. So the cost of this thing is coming down. The technical feasibility is there and it will uh, make uh, power things more reliable. Um, will, should it be the only solution? Probably not. You know, you can, again, make plenty of solar down here on earth. You can make um, uh, nuclear power plants and other like that. So there's other ways to do it. Will it be part of the solution? Will it be superior for some things? I think yes. So, so um, one of the other thoughts that I have as a manufacturer is that making solar panels seems to be dead easy. So, yes, and so it would seem like scaling solar panels would be dead easy. I mean, going from current levels of making solar panels to double, triple, quadruple the number of solar panels, the actual manufacturer of them, it would seem to be dead easy to get to massive massive numbers of solar panels compared to current levels well, we're already at massive massive numbers of solar panels we're making like 100 gigawatt hours per per, per year you know 100 gigawatts of so power. Going, to, going to 10 times that to a terawatt a year i mean it wouldn't be right so big. china's converting over like from a gigafactory to many gigafactories making solar so so you know they're all over that scaling thing and then yeah. they're fairly easy to um what do you want to call it in terms of finding a plot, finding a place to put them, um, you know, arranging to put them in and then, and then installing them. It's a short term, inexpensive compared to anything else. I mean, so I think we're already at a terawatt hour uh, plus from, from solar. And so of, of production right now, of production right now, globally, right. right. You know, 400 terawatt hours, whatever uh, in, in, Out of in the China. Form. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's already, you know, at a, at a significant scale. So now we're saying, you know, mass plan is that we go, you know, 10x or something like that. So, you know, the fact that we're at, you know, the equivalent of a gigafactory making 2 million cars, we're going to go to 20 million cars, right? right? So we're making a terawatt hour, we're going to 10 terawatt hours, right? So it's um, the scale right there, you know, the, the making of it and, you know, the the factories is like 10 more of these factories or, or you know, or, or we're at 10, we go to 100. It's, it's all there. It's, and the supply chain's all there. But, the, you know, the growth is about like 10, 20%. But, you know, like if we have these higher energy demand, then we have to speed it up. Yeah. So, and then uh, I was uh, remarking the other day on my channel, I, 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 I saw a statistic that said only 25 Congress people own BEV vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, that's a redundancy, but BEVs. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 25 out of uh, 435 uh, own BEVs. Um, same thing with regard to government government usage of solar. Um, we have Tesla putting solar on the roofs of their factories now, but we don't have government putting solar on the roofs of their factories or their their buildings. Uh, we don't have uh, we don't have the government in the United States, uh, as they say today, eating their own dog food. Um, I see. It would seem like if we've got overcapacity and it's so inexpensive and it's so efficient, it would seem like government would be leading the way in terms of uh, in terms of getting th this stuff on roofs. Um, I'm not sure what the um, procurement uh, thing is for the government buying it itself. Um, I know that uh, you know Gavin Newsom, you know California, 
it's all over mandating that you have to have solar on residential and on commercial right, stuff. Right. Yeah. So, so the legislation's there and they're moving along. Whether, you know, like I'm sure military bases have their solar and that kind of stuff. So the fact that um, some government buildings don't have it, I don't see that being an issue. Okay, um, I just, it was him like, again, each show, show us the way. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, well, the, you can go back to Jimmy Carter. He put solar panels in the White House, something like that. So, right. so there was some leading there, but you right. know, it's already at, you know, I don't know, ten percent, uh, or you know, it's at a significant level of the whole economy. So, whether the 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 government shoves in a few gigawatt hours, I don't think uh, is okay. All right. All right. Anything else? Uh, I well, let me look. Let me take a quick look at my notes here and see if uh, of. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so, okay. Just a, a little more depth. If you have it, if you know this, if you don't, it's fine. Uh, on the micro nukes, do you see that as they've just installed this one? Uh, they just, uh, uh powered it up yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that that is looking, I mean, I think it was in Georgia, Yeah. which, which was interesting that it was in Georgia. Um, do you think that's something that, uh, potentially now could scale given maybe a shift in attitudes by by uh, folks so again for nuclear power i, I organized the carnival of um, nuclear energy for like uh, i think about 10 years uh, weekly writing about um, nuclear power big proponent uh, one of the first to write about the thorium and molten salt reactors back in the day uh, so i'm no you know I'll, I'll, as much about this as, as, as pretty much anyone so um in terms of um, nuclear reactors. The problem is that when we change from the Atomic Energy Commission to the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission back oh, yeah. in the in the 70s, there had not been a new type of reactor other than a uh, boiler wire reactor, pressure wire reactor approved in the United States. So basically, um, NRC for the past, uh, what, 50 years has basically been uh, squashing nuclear reactors. Right. Um, safety, the fact that you can name every nuclear accident at Chernobyl, <laughs> Three Mile Island, Fukushima, when it's generated, you know, 20% of, you know, world electricity, you know, 15, 20% of world electricity over 50 years means that it's incredibly safe. Yeah. Right. Oh, and no one, right. yeah, no one died Three Mile Island. Okay. But, you know, when, when we first got nuclear power plants in the United States, we were basically, you know, like um, um, Admiral Nimitz, whatever like that was making, a reactor for um, his submarines, and then uh, and he said, "Oh, let's um, you know do that for um, commercial power." So they stuck a um, nuclear submarine on land and made it kind of operate like a coal plant, and they transferred coal workers over to it, and they ran it safely, right, for ten years for you know 20, 30, 50 reactors until the Three Mile Island accident, right? So no accident, they operate for years with coal workers. But then they started layering in all this regulation and stuff. So they made it more expensive. Curiously, it, because it was an actual threat to coal and oil and natural gas, that certain interests who have a lot of money and power, coal, natural gas, and oil, would then stoke the fears of the useful idiots in the environmental movement to stock this up. And they would you know, go back to certain people you know, Jaxo, who led NRC, who was like vehemently anti-nuclear, but he was in charge of the freaking agency right, right. for doing it, right? So they added all these extra costs. So now it takes, instead of taking four or five years, which would, you know, most of them took and which all the French reactors took to make, you know, maybe make 50 or whatever during the 1980s, you know, took our tech and, and, and built them. You can make a reactor in four to five years, a big one, in four or five years and get it done and you know probably do it for like you know four billion dollars something like that for a big gigawatt reactor right because china does it south korea does it you know other places do it right france and did it as well so but then if you lay in a bunch of meaningless regulation and then keep changing the regulation oh right, you do this right. you do that then you know you know when you manufacture if the city or the county says okay in order to expand the plant you gotta do this and you know, i'm gonna change it next week next month you know, your cost of doing everything just, you know, keeps going up and up because they're just making you do more stuff. Okay. So, 
So then supposedly, you know, they've said, okay, yes, nuclear is important for this climate change problem and for other things. So then if we accept it, it's, it's a solution. And it's already, you know, statistically, and I could show the, the numbers because I was one who popularized the death per terabyte hour. Okay. Thing, which got published in papers and stuff like that. I was, one of the, I was the first to write that. You know, it is safer than solar because solar is sticking on the roof. Roofing is the sixth most dangerous job in the world. People fall off of roofs. <laughs> but, you know, you just don't count it up because, oh, one guy died here, another guy died right, here. Right, right, right. You know, it's like, or this guy broke his neck or like that and he's in traction, can't walk or whatever. You know, it's one at a time versus, oh, 10 guys, you know, happened to a nuclear power plant, whatever that. So, so anyway, so then the, um, the small reactors. Small reactors, because we're still in this high expense environment where it's costing, you know, $10, 20000000000 billion to make a big reactor, now make it 10 times smaller and only cost $1 billion. So fine. Now it's affordable for uh, Tennessee Valley Authority and for Georgia uh, Utility, whatever, to, to buy one. But it's, you know, way smaller, right? So now it's still more expensive than other stuff. You get into the range of being reasonable because I used heroic amounts of tech and modular stuff in order to make it reasonably efficient. So they will be capable to be built. You build a few in the United States and then other countries, you know, that want to afford them can, can now more fully be doing it. I can buy them like six packs and 12 packs yeah. of bottles where I can make, you know, several small reactors and I can keep the cost efficient because I make a bunch of small modular ones. So it is an improvement that way. But I don't think these will be a major thing unless there is a actual true, we're going to make this, um, I'm going to take away the roadblock that we put up over the past, you know, 40 years. Gotcha. This gotcha. stuff, right. I'm going to take away that stuff. I'm going to make it efficient because this is actually part of the solution, right? As opposed to the climate change thing where basically we spent trillions of dollars, you know, literally trillions of dollars gone, but then, no actual, you know, real solutions have been done. You know, it's it's, a, it's all tiny tinkering because we're still increasing, you know, these, you know, the CO two and other stuff, right? So, in order for the nuclear thing to become significant, you must factory mass produce the reactors. I must make factory pump out a hundred a year, right? I I looked at all the the companies that are looking to do this. Um, you know, there are several who could, could do it. One of my most favorite is called Thorcon. They're looking to make a molten salt reactor at shipyards. They make them, you know, in the United States or in Europe or something like that. And then with their first customer in Indonesia. So they could mass produce these things, 20, 30, 50 a year gigawatt reactors or, or half gigawatt reactors, which would be, you know, half gigawatt ones to be side of the coal plant that could be on shift and barges and, and then go to where it needs to go, Indonesia, other place, Indonesia. So then if they can make 100 gigawatt hours per year, now we're talking, right? Now we're saying, okay, that's going to be significant. As opposed to I can make a 30 watt or a 60 megawatt reactor and I make six of them and I got you know right, some right, order that make 20. Right. So then that's one, a one gigawatt, two gigawatt reactor. It's meaningless. Noticeably not a threat to existing power uh, interests, right? But not a meaningful part of an overall plan. Whether it succeeds or failed becomes a rounding error, right? right? I think they'll succeed. That can mean the company can make some money, but if it's going to be significant, you got to be doing 100 gigawatt hours per year globally or more. So what about the guys that were doing the container-sized nukes that you were going to put in your neighborhood in concrete and kiss it goodbye for 20 years and then dig it up and those guys, I, I, I can uh, support that, you know, look at the safety of each particular thing. And I have looked at them. Some of the plans technically would work. I don't believe that, um, you know, it's, a, it's, you're asking too much of the, of the regulators to, to make that happen. You I know, see. I don't see, I don't see the people being that desperate to say, you know, they're not even, we could be making 10 reactors in the United States, 10 reactors a year. So you yeah. start them up and then getting, yeah. have an order, but we had like two or four in order and it took 20 years to make them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, we're not the, the, the um, commitment is not there. You yeah. know, China making 20 or 30 a year, right? right. They're completing, you know, 10 years like that. So that's a significant number. Yeah. 
Yeah. But one thing is that the U.S. has to have at least a minimum viable commercial nuclear capability because we have a nuclear navy. Yeah. So they can't let that totally die. Yeah. Right. Even if they have whatever anti environmental thing there, because I'm making, I need to have 200 nuclear reactors working on my, you know, 400, you know, 300 nuclear Navy ships. Right? right. So then I need to have a certain amount of capability in terms of like uh, uh, commercial people. Like, otherwise, the military is the only one buying them, you know, because they work and they're safe enough for, you know, a thousand guys to go into a 5,000 ton can, you know, underneath the, the ocean. And, and they're fine for years. Yes, yes, yes. So, all right. What about Bill Gates and his uh, spent nuclear rods uh, uh, approach to uh, nuclear power? So, nuclear power, uh, spent nuclear rods. So, nuclear waste is basically even numbered uranium, mostly 98%. So, you enrich your odd number, uranium 235, get up from the natural occurring, you know, Three to five percent, up to you know for power, you know twenty percent uh, for m military applications, eighty ninety percent, right? So then you run it, and then the even number ones are still there because you need to hit the even number one with neutrons that are going to be like a thousand times more energy, right? So it can't be done. You can design a reactor where I'm going to be constantly hitting these neutrons at this speed, so then it burns it up. So all the ninety eight percent of the mass of the Nuclear fuel, which we uh, spent nuclear fuel, which is sitting in you know, containers and casks right. on the on the the site of nuclear power plants, is that I can take that out and I could use that uh, because I had say sixty five thousand tons being used per year. I put it in, it's in the reactor for three five years. It comes out, it's still sixty five thousand tons, right? Yeah. I only used a bit of it up, so then, but that's it's two thirty eight, right? So I need to then. I can then take all that. So all my 50 years of using power, I can then take 50 years of global use and then I can just, I don't dig it up. I can just like, I can take this raw, this material and then put it into the reactors designed to burn up that stuff. So then I just, I can just use up that 238 because it's just as good. I'd have to hit it, you know, with a, a harder, hit it with a neutron harder to, to break it up. And then and it's done, I use a fuel. And then the remaining waste after that is, usually mostly stuff that has a half-life of 12 years, mm -hmm. which is like nothing. It's not this yeah. oh, 10,000 years stuff. No, yeah. Yeah. 12 years. And then some of those isotopes I can use for other applications. So, um, But he's been we, talking we, about we, it. They've been talking about that for, I guess, 15, 20 years. Uh, where, where, where is it? Is it going to, is it, is it a thing? Is it going to happen? <laughs> Again, I have to make a new reactor. I have to make a new reactor type. Right, I make a molten salt reactor, which China just did, which we did in the '60s at uh, in the United States at Oak Ridge or something like that, and then China just did it, you know, a two megawatt one. So something that's, you know, two megawatts enough to run, you know, five hundred homes or something like that. Although currently, I think they're both were both thermal. I think they, they did have generate electricity off the one in the '60s, right? So we can do it, and then there's I think a, a university in Texas that said, hey, let's make another two megawatt reactor. They were saying that they can make the nuclear part of this thing in like six months. Wow. Right. So, but then it's like, okay, the other stuff, the years, the regulation, blah, blah, blah. This is like and on the technical side, EV stuff. It's just a matter of like, do we let them do it? I gotcha. Right. Yeah. So uh China's plan to get to you know gigawatts on there. They have a long-term plan of commitment. Right. The technical capability, the US has people who could do this you know, super fast. If it was, if there was a urgent need, we could get them, you know, going up year, two years or whatever. Right. And they're safer and better energy dense. The molten salt versions where, you know, you have, instead of having broad solid rods, it's kind of this, uh, you know, molten slurry. Uh -huh. So if something goes wrong with that one time run at high temperature, if something goes wrong, I have a physical plug at the bottom, which it, I get, I, I want to run at 800 degrees. It goes to a thousand. That plug melts, the stuff falls out gravity wise, and then it, it's in the pan and then it cools down, right? Yeah. So it's walk away safe, right? We're basically have to clean up the pan, but basically that's yeah. it. Yeah. So these things can be even safer than the already safe nuclear reactors that we got. We can mass produce them. We have to choose to do it, but it's a new type of reactor, which I just said the NRC has not approved new reactor in 50 right. years. Right. 
So, and if you actually have the regulatory system say, let's approve a new reactor. Otherwise, you know, China's approving the reactors. China, yeah. Yeah. all the stuff that, you know, the um, International Atomic Energy Agency is talking about, China said, yeah, let's try all, you know, we got like eight different kinds of reactors going up in China. Yeah, they got the Pebble Bay reactor, we just took the, the German stuff. So it all can be done. And, and they're not m more capable than, than the people in the West. It's right. just that they're allowed to do it. Right, 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 right. So interesting. All right. Well, I think we've done that. I think I think this is uh, even better than I was expecting. I hope that it was good for the audience as well. This is, I mean, this is, uh, you know, you just said it a minute ago. We already think that we've, we've, uh, you know, that that GPT is this thing that is going to change the, the world. We already think that uh, going to electric cars is going to change the world. We already think that um, the satellite system that's up there now, which nobody knows about except you and me, I'm glad we're telling a few other people today, the, the satellites that that, test, that uh, Elon is putting in space are going to change. All these things are going to change the world. And now we've got another one. These room temperature semi, uh, or, superconductors, uh, superconductors yeah. are going to change the world. And then, um, but then we're, then, then all of a sudden we have uh, the, the Tony Siba world coming true <laughs> at mm -hmm. so many different levels. It's, yep. it's almost hard to imagine. So mm -hmm. again, I hope that the folks uh, have enjoyed this. Um, as always, amazing to have you on board and mm -hmm. uh, help me with all this stuff that is above my pay grade. And now I feel like I've had a you know graduate level course. So okay. it's, it's all good. All right. right. So Thank you. Again. Yeah. And then uh, hit like if you liked it. So we get uh, Brian back often. And then uh, subscribe, notify, all that stuff, and uh, follow Brian. Next Big Future. He's everywhere. Right. Especially you want to go to nextbigfuture.com. That's the main place he'd like you to visit and check out what he's doing over there. Thanks again, Brian. Thank you, Randy. And to all of you out there, it's been great talking to you.